Uh, yeah, hello everyone. Um, well, it's nice to be here. Um, yeah, so I'll just tell you a tiny bit about myself. Um, I ran an agency in the 2000s and then I realized I was a terrible boss, so I quit. And then I went freelance and then I joined ClearLeft, which is a world-renowned UX agency. And I've just gone freelance again uh, in order to specialize in design strategy and also voice interfaces. So I'm going to show you a little bit of that in a while. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what UX is. Uh, I don't know if it's appropriate, but you know, uh, we'll see. But the first thing I want to do is just ask you a question. What pops into your head when you think of the word design? You don't have to answer it, don't um, But there's this idea that actually design is an incredibly poorly understood thing. So Steve Jobs actually said this. Most people make the mistake of thinking design is what it looks like. People think it's this veneer. But that's not what we think design is. It's not just what it looks and feels like. Design is how it works. So when we talk about like form versus function, right? People attach form to the word design and less so function. But in Apple's case, for example, although we remember them for their incredibly beautiful objects, I can't tell you the amount of thought that goes into how it works. And some incredibly subtle, subtle details about uh, human interaction, like how we interact with machines, um, that they took much more seriously and much more seriously earlier than um, other digital companies or tech companies. Mm. And to illustrate this point, I'm going to tell you a story um, which is quite well known. You can kind of Google it if you like. Uh, this is the story of the $300 million button. So a friend of mine, Jared in the States, he, uh, he's a UX guy, and he was once asked by a big, massive e-commerce retailer to come in and consult on the design. And they said, look, in our checkout process, there's this one screen where we lose, on average, $300 million per annum in people just abandoning their shopping carts. So Jared actually started watching people use the shopping cart, and then they, they fixed the interface. But I'm going to ask you now to have a guess. What was the single word on that button that they fixed? Stick your hand up if you've got an idea. Good. <laughs> no? No? Close? Huh? No. Uh, it was register. So what they did was, yeah, they moved the registration process till after you'd finished buying. And they made an extra $300 million a year. Now, Jared is uh, quite well known in, in usability in UX. And he was the one sat in the labs watching people use this stuff. So they gave people money and they said, right, you know, go and choose a new coat or something, right? And then they just watched what they did. And here's a quote from those sessions where they actually watch people using stuff. <laughs> a real quote. Now, the funny epilogue to this story is that they still got about 70% of signups by putting the sign-up bit of the process after the purchase. So people were happy to be in a bit of a relationship. They just didn't want that to get in the way of them getting their stuff. $300 million button. Now, the question that it raises for me, right, they just moved a button, basically. They just moved a couple of screens around. It probably wasn't much code. It probably wasn't any visual or graphic design. So what is that, then, that Jared was doing? Well, that is what we call UX. It's not even really user interface. It didn't really change the user interface very much. It was understanding the experience that people were going through and what they were thinking and feeling. And I have this analogy, which is that the digital era has created effectively a wall between organizations and their customers. Right? Because when you think of a shop, right, you cannot avoid the feedback. You cannot avoid it. 
If you run a shop, you own a shop, they are just going to come and hassle you and ask you where the organic couscous is. Right? If that is not obvious to customers, they will hassle you. You cannot avoid it. But what happens in the digital realm? Well, we're not in the trains when they're on their phones. We're not in their offices. We're not in their homes. We don't see it. And the only way it's related to organizations is through numbers most of the time, like Google Analytics traditionally, which is mostly unintelligible to the average human being. It doesn't tell you anything about the emotional experience that somebody's going through. So why does... Like, why do experiences end up shitty? I'm sure you all have shitty service and product experiences every day. Well, it mostly happens because people don't even realize they're designing something, and they don't think about the people using that stuff. This is what we call inadvertent design, right? So when engineers say, <laughs> I could throw that together, <laughs> you know, classic. Loads and loads and loads of companies are led by engineers because they're the ones that can make the stuff but then they forget to design. They don't even really understand how important design is. So what happens? Well, I mean, you've got messy human input, and we've got how the system responds. Sorry, my animations are in the wrong order here. Oh, well. So people make the bit at the top, how the system responds, or how the thing is, but then they ignore how messy human input actually works. And actually, this is a conversation. We talk, we talk nowadays about conversation design, but this is not a new concept, right? It's always been like a, a loop between us and the systems. And for most of computing history, one half has been largely ignored. Some organizations understood it and, and, and some didn't. So to understand in you know, everyday terms, um, here is something that Reefa sent me, uh, one of the organizers of today. Um, I wouldn't normally call that an organization, but this is particularly bad. I should think it's from the Arts Council of England, although the photo's been cut off. So you can see here that the way the door works is being explained on the left-hand side. And the funny part of that is that design is like a joke. If you have to explain it, it probably isn't working. <laughs> and you see these examples of passive-aggressive interfaces all around our daily lives when you go into toilets, when you go into offices or doors or shops. You see these messages which are compensating for bad design. Nobody thought about it up front, how the system worked. Not how it looked, how it worked for human beings. So this is the process of UX design, is understanding this stuff and designing for it. So I'll give you a summary of kind of what it's about and, and how we go about it. Mm. Einstein is rumored, but probably didn't say the following. If I had only one hour to save the world, I would spend 55 minutes defining the problem and only five minutes finding the solution. I think it's apocryphal, I think it's bullshit, but anyway. Um, you get the idea, and in fact, th this, this idea rings very, very true when, we, when you actually start to design. We talk a lot about framing the problem, understanding the problem, developing a deep understanding of what the context is and what the, the desired outcomes are. And something that they teach in formal design school is what's called the double diamond. Um, I can't see the screen. This is, I'm staying here for the sake of the microphone, so I'll just sort of lean like this. Um, and that's really not very readable. But anyway, um, so we have this idea that the first phase of design is actually discovery, right? So we go broad. We research a problem space. You know, what are the problems with uh, automatic doors or... Toilet doors on trains are particularly problematic, right? So you, would, you try to understand how people behave and what, what the, example, the good examples are. Uh, and then you narrow it down. You say, okay, we're going to frame the problem now. We're going to state the key problem that our design is going to solve. And when you do that, if, when you've demonstrated that you fully understand the problem, your design is much better, as Einstein was implying. So you've done some discovery, right? And most organizations almost entirely skip this. They just don't think about it. They don't give people the time. They just move straight into production. They just do go, 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 make something. So you skip the understanding. So what happens next? Well, you go into your design phase. And this thing that's, that's borne out in lots of studies is that if you give one group of people um, a, a creative task, and you say, right, have an idea, and then continue to develop it, and then you give another group of people uh, uh, the task, and you say, I want you to, to design 100 ideas, and then pick the best one. Which group wins? Second group, right? Because effectively, if 
you go broad in that second phase design and you design loads and loads and loads of ideas to solve that problem that you framed, you'll find a much, much better idea. And then you pick that idea, you test it, and then you narrow down on it. So this is the, the kind of concept of the, do the, the double diamond. Um, and then talking more specifically about UX, there's this sort of classic book called The Elements of UX Design. Wow, that's just super unreadable. Um, but let me, oh, I can't move from the mic, sorry. <laughs> um, so uh, d don't bother reading that right-hand column, but effectively what we have here is this idea that effectively down the bottom we've got like strategy, this is very abstract, it's very conceptual, and then up to the surface, right? So you move through things like what's the scope, like what are we actually making here, what's the structure of it, how do people navigate through it, what's the skeleton, the wireframe, what appears on the screens, and then the surface is like colors and fonts and, and images, right? Now, when we think about design, as I mentioned earlier, right, people jump straight to the surface and they skip all the stuff that's under, under that surface. So as a UX designer, you are spending actually most of your time thinking about what's under the hood. What are the underlying ideas? What are the underlying values, the ideals, the outcomes that we're actually looking to produce, both for the people that we are serving and the organization that we work for? But this truth that bears out over and over again is that if you focus on the people you're serving rather than serving the organization, you'll just end up producing much better outcomes for the organization. Anyway, so that's the kind of conceptual layers. So UX focuses on how people experience design, not the thing you are designing. Very important key distinction. Um, so often I'll have stakeholders sit in rooms watching people use stuff, and I want them to watch the people. I don't want them to watch the interface. Look at the reactions, the body language, the, like the facial expressions. Think about what they are saying versus what they are not saying, what they are implying with their language. Because, being the son of a Dutchman, I'm acutely aware that English people are not very good at giving direct feedback. So you have to get good at reading the signals. So if we, if we consider that it's about you know, what people experience and it's all about this under the surface stuff, what, you know, what are we playing with? Well, it's mostly post-its, if I'm brutally honest. Right? This is how I conceptualize most of my work. Um, this is actually from a research session where I asked a team of 12 people to gather observations and we had hundreds of observations about something we tested and then we sorted through them. So if we were to summarize like, kind of what are we kind of going for, what are the qualities that we're looking for in most designs, mostly but not always, it's kind of this. Making things useful, usable and desirable. Not always desirable. Um, I'll show you an example for the council that I worked on. That's something that people have to use. But it's most commercial products generally are trying to persuade, right? They're trying to get you to use something, trying to make it desirable. But yeah, useful and usable. Like I can find my, around, my way around it. It solves the problem that I had. So what are those sort of more specific key UX skills that we go through? Um, so I'll just start with a really broad one. And this is just purely for illustrative purposes, this diagram. Um, strategy, right? So you've got to be able to understand how you're going to meet those or that organization's goals and you've got to be able to organize the work working towards those goals. Another thing I spend a lot of time doing is research and testing. So I mentioned observing. So this is a huge part of UX, just literally designing a prototype or a basic thing and then or an exist, taking an existing product and say, you get a user in and you say, hey, you're trying to book tickets to the cinema. Uh, go ahead and you just observe. You don't interfere, you don't help them, you just observe. Ask questions afterwards, right? So, and, and often I, I mentioned that uh, this, is, this is also not just after the fact, right, once you've got a design, but also before the fact, because often in your discovery phase, you're trying to learn about how people use, let's say, a competitor's product. So another big thing uh, in UX is actually what we call information architecture. So what are the words, the labels, the groupings? How is information being organized so that people can find their way around it? Um, this is kind of the key task of the digital age. Um, if a website is unusable, nine times out of 10, it's got bad labels and bad organization, uh, information hierarchy. So you do a lot of this. I won't go into the methods, but you do a lot of this kind of mapping. And then finally, let's say you've been through all this and you've kind of got a structure in mind. Um, well, it comes down to interaction design, right? So you sketch out a lot of these ideas. So I 
just put up Spotify. There's a lot of thinking gone into how things move, what information is being displayed, which particular fields, what's the order of them, what are the labels. So huge amounts of detail going into how the user, you remember that feedback loop, how the person is interacting with the system in order to meet their goals. Okay, so I'm almost done. Um, but I want to tell you about something that I'm kind of sort of proud of. Um, it's not the biggest, most important thing I've ever worked on, um, but it is one I'm proud of, and I have possibly helped all of you in a really, really tiny way. So a few years ago, um, Brighton Council came to Clearleft and said, listen, we've got a tiny amount of money, but can you help us with our website and help make things better for citizens? Uh, so we took a tiny budget and we said, okay, well, what is the biggest problem we can solve with the smallest amount of money? Uh, and it was actually the information architecture. So we did a bit of redesign, but not a lot. The council has 700 services and you can't possibly think about redesigning all of those. So all we really did was sort of touch the surface of the website. Um, and this is what it looks like today. The design is actually relatively intact six years later. Um, but it looked horrendous before this point and nobody could navigate to any of those 700 services and people were just getting lost. So the results, well, um, about a year later we measured like how quickly are people getting to the information that they actually needed. And on average we improved the visit time by about a minute. Now that doesn't sound like much, it's probably in relatively imperceptible to an individual. But I want you to think about how many people live in the city and how many millions of people are using that website and how much time the work that we did might have saved them in aggregate. In aggregate. It actually adds up to decades of time for the city. And that is the thing that I am most proud of in my career because I can walk around the city and look at most of the people that live here and say, I've helped you in a way that's like, it's kind of a little secret. And I'm really proud of that. Um, I want to tell you just a couple of little extra things. Um, UX is kind of morphing into, well, you really can't see that. UX is kind of morphing into what we call service design. Because, um, so, you know, if you think about designing a service, let's say, I don't know, uh, the experience of going through an airport. So much of that experience and, you know, checking in and getting on the plane and all that stuff is being defined by the digital world now that actually it makes a lot of sense to do that from a digital first perspective because now people have phones with them all the time. So UX is now sort of morphing into UX design and increasingly designers are being asked to think in a much bigger picture in a wider context. And I would argue that if they don't, they're not doing their jobs properly. Or more commonly, an organization will say, hey, just design this little thing over here and then you realize the problem is actually with the wider service. So if you decide to go into UX, it's highly rewarding and it, its scope is sort of increasing as a career. It will have a much wider impact. I mean, think about Airbnb, right? People who are trained in designing screens are now affecting the experience you go through when you stay somewhere. Um, so I'll round up and then maybe questions? I, I don't know um, if there's time for that. But uh, let me switch back. Okay, um, Ursula Franklin, she's a Canadian physicist, uh, and she said this, technology is not things, it is, not, it is practice. And what she meant by that is that we, we focus on the thing, but actually what, what, what technology means for humanity is the rituals, the behaviours, the habits, right? Think about these things. We've all become like Gollum, right? The precious, I call this my precious, right? I can't stop looking at it. So the important thing for a UX designer to focus on are the outcomes, the behaviors. What are we turning people into when they use our products? Don't focus on the things. Organizations and technologists love to focus on the shiny thing. As a UX designer, our job is to focus on what we are doing for humanity. Thank you. <laughs>